everybody, my name is Jason, and I am thrilled to welcome you to this conversation that I get to have with a friend of mine, Jamie Finn. Jamie writes at fosterthefamilyblog.com. She also speaks, and she also runs a ministry uh, right there in her own community. And I'm excited for you to get to know her a little bit more, get to know her family a little bit more, learn about her ministry, and also discover why, under no circumstances whatsoever, if you are ever given the opportunity, should you ever go through the KFC drive through with Jamie Finn. So if you're intrigued, you're wondering what that's all about, I'd encourage you to keep watching. I hope that you are encouraged, inspired, and challenged, and that it's a fun conversation for you to be a part of. Thanks. Thanks so much for being willing to do this and maneuvering the, the gymnastics at home to get kids situated and your husband kicking in, I'm sure, helping. So thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so happy to connect with you. I mean, I'm I'm happy to connect with anyone right now, but I'm particularly yep. happy to connect with you. I'm very I'm very flattered, and I know that you and I have uh, we cross paths multiple times a year, probably uh, literally crossing paths quickly, running from right. one breakout to another at different conferences. Right. It's good to finally like sit down and look each other kind of in the eyes and have a <laughs> yeah. conversation. So my goal today is really just to connect to. Um, get to know you a little bit and those who are watching kind of get a little peek behind uh, Jamie and one of the things I particularly love about the strange awkward season that we're in is you kind of get a glimpse into people's real life a little bit right yeah like, yeah we all kind of let the guard down a little bit and you can see each other's backgrounds and where they live and if you're okay I want to jump right in yeah let's do it cool. so this has nothing to do with anything of 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 you know foster care or encouraging families but uh, I want to know like what's the spot in your house where you go to either pray spend time with the Lord read or like hide from your kids like yeah so are you I'm in the spot. I it. am but you know with foster care we we have a crib in our bedroom so okay. that <laughs> I'm in my corner in the bedroom where I have my stack of books actually like six stacks of books in my reading chair, but there's also a crib in here as there's an extra bed in every room of the house. Right. So I, I share it. I have to share it with the baby, but this is my spot. Now your spot is incredible, right? You are in your backyard. Is that right? I, I, I am in my backyard. Yeah. So this is like a separate office that we got to build. And this is kind of, you know, I, I have a ping pong trophy from when I was a kid and like a couple <laughs> soccer trophies, uh, but I wasn't great. These are kind of my trophies and I like like real books that I can smell yeah. and underline. Yeah. So um, hopefully many years from now when I pass away and I, I pass down my books to my kids, they won't be too annoyed with me that they're having to sort through all of dad's old books and what do we do with these things. So I, I have a major collection as well. In fact, it was recommended to me recently that I get some books for my Kindle and all because it's hard to get books from Amazon right now. I'm like, no, no, no. That is not how you read books. You read right. them in your hands. You turn the pages. So totally, I'm right there totally right with you. So, hey, what's one unexpected joy uh, that you've been able to experience through all of this, just being on lockdown in our homes and yeah. uh, schedules being disrupted? Uh, obviously there's so much about, oh my gosh, it's so hard and it's difficult, but I'm curious, like what's been joyful for you? What's, what have you said? Gosh, I, I actually really enjoy this about this time. Yeah, I would say that I am someone who really struggles to slow down. I really struggle to, to sit and not do anything. If there's extra space in the day, it feels like a piece of the day that should be being used yeah. in some way. And so this is this is a gift for my family right now. There isn't financial distress. We have a backyard, all of those things. I know that's not the case for a lot of families. But for our family right now, this is a time of me sitting and resting and sleeping in and reading books and things that are usually really hard for me to do because I tend to be so kind of productivity driven and wanting to do more and, and do better. And so it's really been a gift just to enjoy my family and to have this forced rest because I, I don't choose rest as often as I should. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't it 
crazy how it's really for a lot of us exposed to this idol of activity and yeah. productivity and um, you're right. And it's probably taken me a few weeks to actually be okay with, sometimes it's okay to just sit and read. Like uh, there's been a decompression for sure. So what are you reading right now? I actually just finished this morning. Um, Sarah Haggerty has a new book called Adore, which is really good. It's like abiding in Christ in the middle parts of your day. And so I started this morning because you don't ever finish a book without immediately starting a new one. Uh, Jen Wilkins book, Women of the Word. Smart. So your rule is I don't uh, finish a book without immediately starting a new one. The other rule is that I'm typically reading like five books at a time. So I have my like, this is what I read with my devotions. This is what I read uh, for fun. This is what I read when I feel like something heavy or light. So I listed two, but in there, there's, you know, I'm reading Michelle Obama's <laughs> biography. Yeah. I'm reading uh, an Enneagram book, the, the Path Between Us. So I, I always have my fingers in lots of different books. Without going too deep into it, are you willing to share what number? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll talk about the Enneagram anytime okay. well what what number are are you i'm a seven okay so you're up for you're up for a good time yeah and yeah. also always looking for the next thing which is why something like this it's it's something i've been working on in general okay i don't need to look to the next thing i don't need to what's the the most exciting part of this day how can i end this day with some fun adventure it's like okay i can sit and yeah. i can rest and so it's been work that I've been doing, and now this is forcing me. But yeah, I'm a seven. Cool. What about you? I haven't, I haven't dove too deep into it personally, but a lot of people that I know around me have um, uh, been very free to share with me what they <laughs> believe I am. And uh, that would be a one. So consistently, right. I know that I'm a one, which uh, high, high, highly critical. There's a certain way to do things. And... I'm actually, I live with the one, so I, I the, know the, yeah, my husband's the yeah. one. So it struck me most, we had some friends over not long ago, and um, we, we had, we've just renovated our house, uh, we bought a house, renovated and moved into it, and um, we had some friends over, and, and they were saying, gosh, you guys are so creative, how you can look at the space and do this, and I was sitting there thinking, I don't feel creative, and she was even saying, even in the work you do, like, you create things, and I'm listening, thinking, I don't feel creative, and, and I told her, it doesn't feel creative to me. And she says, well, what does it feel like? I said, well, it feels like the house was wrong and it needed to be made right. And she's <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Right way to and do this. And even the I don't feel creative is that inner critic. Oh, I'm not creative. There you creative. go. Yeah. She <laughs> said, oh my gosh, that is such a one thing to say. That is yeah, so yeah. fun. So I yeah. am embracing that in the good and the bad, for sure. Yeah. Hey, um, so you, I, I would... I would argue that you are probably um, one of the most well-respected voices, not just female voices, but voices in this foster care adoption space. But I would also suggest it goes beyond that, that there's foster care and there's adoption and stepping into hard places. But that is that is a certain avenue that speaks to a larger context that I think you and I both resonate with. And that's just encouraging people to follow Jesus and discipleship and kind of being deeply rooted in the gospel and living right. that out. And so um, many, many people know about your writing and your teaching. And But I want to dive a little bit into kind of some of the backstory. Like what led you and your husband into this? What was that process like? And how have you seen um, your particular story reflected in other people's stories that you've encountered and like how do you encourage them as they're walking through some of the same things that you guys walked through sure yeah yeah i would say the the jump into foster care was very different for my husband and i as a one he was very driven by conviction so i go to god's word i see that god tells me to care for orphans i don't want to do it yeah. but i want to follow god and so i'm going to do this I was just the right thing to do. Right. Exactly. You That's do the right, you follow God's word. Right. And so, you know, if you ask him now, when did you know you wanted to be a foster parent? He would say, I still don't want to be a foster parent. <laughs> I, 
I am doing what I believe God has called me to. And there's joy in that. And there's joy in obedience and there's joy in the children we've loved. And, but it's not a, a desire for him. For me, there was more of that, that burning desire. And I think it, it really was driven by, I want my life to matter hmm. for Jesus. And that was what it started with. I want to do things that affect the world and bring kingdom work. For me, though, it was very rooted in caring for children. I, I understood that the gospel reflected adoption and that there was great beauty in that. But I think what I lacked was the full understanding of redemption and the family that God is committed to redemption and not just, you know, rescuing children, but really redeeming families and healing families. Yeah. So that has been a major evolution in what God has done in my heart in really humbling me. This isn't about me coming in in the savior role and rescuing a child. This is about being committed to his work of redemption on this earth. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And what, as you guys stepped into this through kind of different lenses, different approaches, like this is the right thing to do. And this is, right. there's kind of my passion. What, what particular hurdles or questions did you guys have to answer together? And, and uh, if, if you were sitting down with a couple right now, who is right now in the position that you guys were in several years ago, like, what would you say to them? How would you yeah. encourage them? Because what we do know is that there's, we're constantly interacting with people who are not only they're already involved and they're not, I don't think that there's such thing as like knee deep in it's always like neck deep in or right, right. Our head, right. So you're either neck deep in or like you're just now considering. And so sitting across the table from those who are considering they're in that place that you guys were um, several years ago. What do you say to them now? Yeah. I think what I didn't do well was try to manipulate my husband's emotions. <laughs> you didn't manipulate? I didn't. Well, okay. well <laughs> that was the piece I didn't do well. Trying to manipulate him into this is what we should do and there's this need. Okay. I think what I did do well is ask him to go to God's word okay. and ask him to go to God and ask that God would would change one of our hearts. I mean, we weren't on the same page, but we both wanted to follow Jesus in radical ways to love others. And so when we, when we stopped making it about how should we do this and what should we do and really went to God's word, we both became convinced of this is a way that we can, as a family unit, you know, we were, we had a toddler and a preschooler. So the mission field was being more limited. You know, I, as a teenager, would have had dreams of, of being in an orphanage somewhere around the world. And, but that started to be limited as we had this very kind of American dream sort of family. And so it was this reorienting of, okay, we have this family and this home and these jobs. What does it look like to not just be committed to happier and better and more? What does it look like to live radically in the midst of this life that God has called us to? And we knew that God was calling us to orphan care because he calls everyone to orphan care, but it was, okay, how? And I think going to God's word and just being convinced of his heart was what it took to bring us both on the same page of, we don't know what the next step is, but we know what God's heart is. And so we're going to follow this and we're going to see where it goes. And so for us, it was very, we're going to one child at a time, very controlled and limited, take it day by day. And, you know, here we are five kids later and there's no end. In so I was going to ask, so where are you now? What is your, what does your family look like now? Yeah. So we have two biological children, two adopted from foster care. And then we've had one, foster daughter who's been with us 16 months at this point wow. yeah okay. um and remind then remind me where, where do you guys live we live in new jersey 
Okay. Is that home for you? Did you grow up there? Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Okay. So I have to ask, um, tell me like a, a Jersey stereotype that you fall into and then tell me a Jersey stereotype that you don't. Okay. Uh, Jersey stereotype. We, so we're Philly. There's New York, Jersey and Philly, Jersey. Okay. I didn't know that. I yeah. grew up in Texas. I live in Texas. So there's Texas and then there's yeah. a lot of other geography that we don't really you know. <laughs> yeah. I just want something new from you. So, yeah. So, so we're Philly, Jersey. Okay. So any stereotype you would have of Philly, I would say specifically Philadelphia sports fans. Okay. Would be very true. So we fall into every stereotype of Philly sports fans. Interesting. All right. The ones we don't fall into are the, what you would probably consider a Jersey, which is the New York Jersey. So when you think Jersey Shore, we are not Jersey Shore. They don't go to our shore. That's not our people. That's the New York. So when you're thinking New Jersey, you're probably not thinking of us. When you're thinking Philly, you're thinking of us. <laughs> Fascinating. So within the Jersey culture, yeah. Is, there's very clear lines drawn between the Philly and the New York. Definitely. And I have people that I would call Jersey. Now, the more I travel, the more I've learned that I'm maybe more Jersey. Wow. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. It's stronger than I would like to believe. But. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, everywhere I travel, I, I've grown up in Texas. We live in Texas. And you know, I'll pour my heart out on stage or in a breakout and just, you know, just lay it all out for Jesus. And people are always real encouraging, but I'm usually like the first person up. Uh, the, it, the first thing they want to say is, you don't sound like you're from Texas. And my, one of my first thoughts is like, that's, I hope you, I hope you got more out of it than that, but I'm, you know, <laughs> I, I'm trusting you did, but uh, they're always really confused because I guess yeah. there's kind of this, uh, there's a perception everybody in Texas rides horses and lives right. on farms and has cows. And I, yeah, my perception would come from uh, Friday Night Lights. Ah, uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. We'll recommend <laughs> that. So if you haven't, if you're watching this, you haven't seen that, check that out. That's a, that's that a is my, my all time favorite TV show. I love it. So that's your family currently, right now. Um, five kiddos with you yeah and we have an open spot that we are open spot, looking to fill. live in jersey yeah. do you have family around that that helps you guys yeah yeah my brother actually lives on my street oh. um and i have two brothers i'm the oldest and we have 12 kids together four are biological four are adopted and four are foster yeah that's the math between you and your two brothers yeah yep so my baby brother got married a little over a year ago, he's 25, and they have two foster children. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And my other brother has, has the same breakdown that we have, two biological, two adopted, and one foster. So it is very much a family yeah. mission. And we even, I mean, we, we've been going on walks because they live on our street. So right. it's social distancing friendly, but we are feeling very connected to them. And we're just talking about our cases and our conversation with birth mom and how to handle this worker. And there is nothing like that unique of a, a community. I mean, I have community outside of that in the church, but also in foster care circles. But having it in the family like that is just yeah. such a gift. That's, that's beautiful. We yeah. live in the same neighborhood as my, my, the, my wife's entire family. So her parents, her brother and his family and her sister and, and their family. So, uh, and that's why we live where we live. We can live anywhere, but we choose to live where we live to be yeah. close to family. So yeah, we, we would have to make a, a group purchase somewhere if we were ever going to move anywhere. My parent, as soon as we moved here, everyone moved close and we're all within five minutes. Yeah. So, um, you're not only a foster family and a family of foster families apparently, but, um, in much of the work you do, obviously there's a lot that goes on within your home, but even outside your home, that has God has given you an opportunity to bring that um, outside of your home for the good of others. And so you do that in a variety of ways, obviously through your writing and through speaking. But talk to us a little bit also about 
some of the, the work you do right there locally, because um, uh, maybe a lot of people know you as a writer, speaker, blogger, um, and we tend to live in this online social media world sometimes, but um, fascinating to know that this is deeply seated in the culture of your family, um, uh, but also you do a lot of a lot of local work. So what does that look like, and, and um, where did that come about? Yeah. Well, the easy answer of where it came about was a conviction of everything you just said of serving in a more public context and having a conviction about really serving local families um, and not just doing that in a way that was online with strangers, but getting to know the families in our community. So it started with a support group that started two and a half years ago. And from that support group, it evolved into a community and a mission to serve the local foster families. So we, um, New Jersey is a very populated state. We, I, in my county, we actually have, I live in Camden County, Camden City is infamous for being, you know, a drug capital on the North, mm -hmm. Northeast. So we have a huge need in our in our local community. So we serve three counties and we are looking to serve the families in our counties in an emergent way and in a holistic way. So when a family welcomes a new foster placement, we are showing up at the doorstep of that family with everything the child needs for the first 24 hours. So I'm sure you know that run to Target at 11 o'clock at night because they need clothes and they need the right formula and all of that. So we're looking to eliminate that and to make them feel right away like there are people there who want to care for them, who want to surround them. And so along with all those supplies, they're coming a, a meal for the family, resources, invitation to a support group. So we're looking to really practically serve that family and give them everything they need. But the other part of the mission is to pull them into community where there's relationships and education and care and mentorship. Um, and then the other part of this, which I know you're really is a big part of your mission is to mobilize the church to do that and to mobilize the community to do that. So it was born out of my experience as a foster parent and the needs that I knew I had yeah. and how alone I felt. But it's also born out of the people who come to me all the time and say, I'm not going to become a foster parent, but I have a heart to serve these families. And so many people want to get involved in serving vulnerable children, in serving foster families, but just aren't even sure how. So we basically serve as a connecting piece for the families who need the care the children who need the supplies, and then churches, businesses, organizations, and we're looking to mobilize them to serve the needs of these families. Awesome, very cool. So what does that look like right now in the, the unprecedented season that we're in? We're distanced, we, we can't connect. What are some practical ways that you've seen churches, organizations, ministries, um, people serving people, like? If someone's watching this now and saying, you know, how, how can our church um, do some simple things that are significant? Or how can we as a family, even in this distance stage that we're in now, really practically serve families? What would you say? How can, how can we do that? How can we continue to do the ministry that we've been doing, but in a completely adapted kind of way? Yeah. I... We both know that the best way to serve families is in relationship. And so if there are relationships already, this is the time to press into those relationships. So the same way, you know, you're reaching out to other friends and family, texting, dropping supplies. We are just doing all kinds of drive-by drops. <laughs> We're not looking to come in contact with families, but we want to know what they need. And so as an organization, that's what we've been doing. If you are in relationship with foster families, also vulnerable families. I mean, this is the time when we're talking about family preservation, 
this is the time when families really need us to come alongside of them and preserve. I mean, the, the saddest reality is when families are broken apart because of poverty, because of need. And so as God's people, when we have an abundance, or even if we don't have an abundance and we're giving in want, this is the time where we can really come alongside vulnerable families. So that single mom in your church, yeah, that's not a foster family, but this is a vulnerable, this is a potential foster child. This We're looking to not just help children once they're in the system, but really come alongside of families and help before then. So I would say dropping groceries to that single mom, seeing what she needs. I mean, we're not supposed to be taking kids to grocery stores right now. So think of the people in your life who can't get to grocery stores. And those are the people we can show up for. But then also, of course, the foster families that you know, adoptive families. I mean, those of us parenting kids with special needs, with trauma backgrounds, it is, it's a hard time for them to lose the routine, to be stuck inside, to maybe not have access to the services. So just to love that family, I mean, drop a meal, whatever it may be. And then as someone who runs a nonprofit, I'll say, give to the organizations that really are on the ground. If you're sitting in your house and you're saying, I don't have those relationships, I don't know what to do. There are organizations that, that, are really feet to the ground right now that you can uh, that you can support financially. We found out about a family that was having trouble because both parents were working accessing the free lunches that the five kids usually get, and so they're in this position where financially they're really struggling to feed these kids, but they can't get access. So we grocery shop for them and just bought tons of easy lunch foods and dropped it on their doorstep. And so we're really seeking to mobilize our volunteers to meet the needs of families that can't get out. That's good. And so just get creative and think very practically, especially for those of us who maybe take certain things for granted. And we look around and say, um, what, what are, what are things that come maybe easy for me that I take for granted that there's likely a lot of people out there that this is a major hurdle every day for them and a major concern. And, And you're right. What this does is, seasons like this and times like this expose expose us all and um you know in our experience we found that especially working with with young moms in particular um that the only difference between us and them frankly is that when things get hard uh we don't fall very far because we've got a pretty strong base of community and family and resources uh but when things get hard for them they fall far because there's just not that infrastructure. And what um, seasons like this are exposing is who has the infrastructure and who doesn't. And one thing I'm encouraged about, even in this discouraging time, is seeing the church start to have more practical conversations about who are the most vulnerable around us and how do we practically serve them. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that that will um, continue to resonate and, and shift culture. So um, love the work that you're doing, love the practical ideas. And if if someone wants to like learn more or shoot you guys, your nonprofit, a message like, hey, what can, are there practical ways that we can help? How would they do that? Fosterthefamily.org is the organization. And so that has a breakdown of everything that we do and, and any way that you can help. Awesome. Uh, one more kind of serious question, and then we're going to end on um, a high note. Not that the serious questions aren't high and important, but uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll see what I mean. One of the things I appreciate most about your message and the, the tone and even the, the, the um, temperament that you bring and the language that you bring is this very balanced, gospel-centered message between um, this is really, really hard but there is so much hope and like that tension that we all navigate through between um, uh, the raw and the realistic, but the true and the hopeful. And just quickly kind of like talk us through the need for that tension and how the gospel speaks into that tension. Cause 
uh, I love how you do that. And those voices are few and far between. And um, uh, I just, I appreciate what you have to say on matters like this. So. I mean, I love that you said gospel center because that is it. I mean, the gospel is the bad news <laughs> becoming the best news. Yeah. And so we don't have to ignore one to focus on the other. It's grace is beautiful because when you see it on the black velvet of, of sin, it's that much more beautiful. And I think that that can be the lens that we look through this work is, yeah, this is hard and this is broken and there's injustice. But, and for me, it's always been, I love Lamentations 3. That is what drives me in my writing, in my speaking, and in my speaking to my own heart is, you know, it's a book of lamenting. Things are not as they should be. God's people are suffering. He's suffering, suffering personally and lamenting. And yet in the middle of that, in Lamentations 3, it's, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassions never, and he just starts speaking to himself all these amazing truths about God that change the reality. So the situation doesn't change. Yeah. It's, just as broken. Things aren't as they should be. He's still suffering. And yet that perspective shift of who God is changes everything. Um, for me, writing and speaking are such a gift. I, I guess it's equivalent to like journaling where you start off with the lamenting and then there's a responsibility you have when you're writing something that you don't just spew bad news at people that there's a, okay, but where is God in this? His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So you that to yourself over and exactly. over. Exactly. Yeah. So, so my, when I'm writing that, it's, it's the preaching I'm doing in my own heart. And I mean, we both know we're not just talking about this where we're living it. So I know how much my kids have been hurt by their parents, by a broken system. I know how injust this is. I, this, isn't, this isn't something that is far from me that I'm just kind of like throwing hope at. I'm living the really hard parts of it. And I wanna be real about that because I want people to know how hard it is if they're considering jumping in. I want people who are in the hard to know that it's not just like butterflies over here and we're good and happy. Um, but it doesn't have to stay there in our hearts. Even if the situation doesn't change, our perspective can change when we fight and preach to our hearts to really see God and his character, it changes everything. I love it. I, I love the idea of pre just preaching the gospel to yourself oh, continually. Um, yeah. Uh, preaching what's true, recognizing what's a lie and what's not true and even recognizing I've been, I've been spending quite a bit of time in this idea that my thoughts are not your thoughts. My, mm -hmm. uh, Paul says that one of the, one of the most crucial parts of our sanctification is the transformation of our minds. Like there's just something broken in the way that we think sometimes. Right. Uh, right. And, and oftentimes God's perspective is so counterintuitive to the way that we're wired to think. And that preaching of the gospel to ourselves helps to rewire and, and redeem the way that we think. Um, yeah. Because yeah. sometimes we just don't think well about things. Yeah. And what I love is it can feel like faking sometimes. It can feel yeah. like I'm putting on happy thoughts. I don't believe this, but I'm going to say it to myself. But the beauty of it is what you just said. It transforms us. The gospel isn't just something that we tell ourselves and choose to believe. It actually comes and changes what we believe, changes yeah. our thoughts and feelings. And so that's the beauty of fighting for that is that we fight to hold on to those truths, but then those truths change us and transform us. Hey, real quick. Uh, what's your, when all this is said and done and you and your husband are able to get out and go on a date, like what's your first favorite? We can't wait to go do this. Yeah. Thing? Well, well you hit it on the, I am not a let's go hiking in the woods or I want to sit at a restaurant and I want to eat good food and I want to drink a bottle of wine with my husband and talk. And so like, there's this meme going around that what this has shown me is like that my hobbies all involve spending money and eating at restaurants. And I'm like, yep. That is, 
<laughs> I can't wait for that. I, I want some good Mexican food and I want to sit and talk with my husband without kids yes. running in. <laughs> us too. Get us to the Tex-Mex for sure. Yeah. Um, last question. It might throw you for a loop. Probably not though. You'll have a good answer. And then I'm going to uh, thank you for spending time yeah. uh, and then we'll jump off. Tell us something about yourself that sounds untrue, but it's actually true. All right. Sounds untrue, but so I have a funny answer for this. And then I have a real answer that, you know, those like two truths and a lie. This is always one of mine. I have been in two car accidents in KFC drive throughs <laughs> two separate times. I have backed up into the car behind me in a KFC drive through Do you continue so, to go to KFC? I don't. Well, I'm, I, the funniest part of the story is that I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> so, but as a teenager, that's what, when you have a, a hungry person and ADHD and a vehicle, you get into trouble. That's so, funny. but right. my, my other, my real answer there is that I never wanted to be a mom. And so I didn't want kids. And so this reality of five kids and open doors and all of that is, it's a huge ministry about family. Yeah. That's, right, yep, that's where I start. Awesome. I love it. So if you're ever um, hanging out with Jamie and she suggests that you go grab some KFC, uh, you'll, you'll say, absolutely not. That's dangerous territory, apparently. That's the one thing you learned from, from this time. That's right. If nothing else, don't yeah. go to KFC with Jamie Finn. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for hanging out and spending time. And uh, super grateful for you, your ministry, the way you speak truth into so many people's lives, uh, both men and women. Uh, married and single, fostering and those considering, and then even those that are just even outside of that circle, just people who are saying, how can I, like you said, how can I make my life count for something for the kingdom and be meaningful and follow Jesus into that? So super grateful for you. Uh, we're going to link to some of your stuff. And um, for those who the for those who've been living under a rock and don't know who you are yet, now they will and they do. And uh, we're super grateful to push them towards you to be encouraged by you. So thanks so much, Jamie. Thank you, Jason. Awesome. Bye-bye.